morning once again. Welcome to another episode of Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Review. We are nearing the end. We are actually at the end, sorry, of the quarters study. And uh, this is uh, final, the final Tuesday morning. And we have our regular guests, our regular elders with us to assist us in understanding and bringing out or pulling some threads from the Word of God so that we can understand the Word of God for us this morning. Today's lesson is entitled The Death of Moses. And if you've been watching Whispering Hope for the past week, for the past few days of the week, you would have realized we're looking at the closing stages of Deuteronomy, where Moses would have died. And also as we go on in the week, you'll see how he would have, God would have something great in store for him. So this morning, we want to welcome once again, for the final time in this quarter, in this year, Elder Jacqueline Gordon, welcome. Good morning, good morning, and happy to be here once again. Thanks. Good for you to be here with us. And Elder David, Andy David. Yes, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here as usual. Trust that we'll have okay. a good time this morning in the Lord. Excellent. All right. So, Elders, we're going to begin now. I'm going to ask Elder David to read our memory text for us today. And then after he would have read the memory text for for this week, sorry, Elder Gordon give us our opening prayer and we'll go straight ahead into our lesson for today. Okay, our memory text today is taken from Jude 9, Jude 9, New King James Version. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring again him a revealing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Almighty God and our Holy Father, God, we are so thankful that you have granted us this opportunity whereby we can come together again just to go into your word because indeed, dear God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So edify us today with the aid of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, at the end of today's discussion, let all of us have a closer walk with you and indeed we'll be ready for your second coming in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that prayer, Elder Gordon, and for Elder David reading our memory text. Interestingly, elders, our memory text comes from the book of Jude. I mean, Jude only has one chapter, Jude verse 9. And we're talking this morning about the topic on Tuesday's lessons, the death of Moses. We have seen the sin of Moses, part one and part two, in the past two days. Moses did commit a sin. And now we're looking at the death of Moses. Now, elders, as we look at this lesson for today, as again, I'm saying it comes from Jude, and it seems to imply something there in Jude. Now, Elder David would have read the text. I don't know if, Elder, you want to just give us an insight as to what actually took place there. What is Jude saying? Because this is the text for the entire week, the last week. And so what, what is happening in Jude there? And why is it not in Deuteronomy? Jude, verse 9. Well, there seemed to be a concern over the burial of Moses. And here, the archangel Michael, God, Jesus himself, was not prepared to get into no verbal dispute or argument with the devil. The fact remained that God and God alone buried Moses and it stands there. No one should know where he was buried and that between, is left between God and God alone. But the enemy wanted to know, but it was not his business. And so the archangel basically, as he said, contend with him, leave it alone. It's not your business. All right, all right. So we see there wasn't any quarreling as such. And not from this quarter study, but from other studies and from further studies that our viewers may want to study. The reference there, uh, we believe, or I believe certainly, that the archangel being referred to there is that of Michael, uh, which is Jesus Christ himself. Moses died, and Jude here, the memory text for this week, is saying that when Michael the archangel is contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, they had not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. And so this is setting up for us 
the understanding that number one, Moses died because they're talking about the body of Moses. So we have Michael the Archangel, who we've seen in scripture before, and he's contending with the devil, formerly known as Lucifer, the adversary, about the body of Moses. So let's get into our lesson then and let's see why is it that there was a dispute and what is the contention about the body of Moses. So in, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 to 12, it's kind of lengthy, but that is the basis for today's study, the death of Moses. Because viewers who were watching yesterday, the day before, know that Moses sinned. And now they are on the brink of going over into the promised land. But hey, something happens. Uh, Elder David, could you read for us the first, the first five verses, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 1 to 5. And then we're going to stop. We're going to look at what's happening and then we're going to proceed onwards. Just to get the foundation of the text. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 34, reading from the New International Version, the Bible says that Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all of the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho to the city of Palms, as far as Zohar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said, I will give it to your descendants, I have let you see it with your own eyes. You will not cross over into it. And verse 5 says, And Moses, servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. So, Elder David, we're seeing here that Moses went up from the plains of Moab and he went on the Mount Nebo, as the word of God says. Explain what happened there, because I'm seeing a lot of strange words and some tribes mention and what, what is going on here with Moses and God? Well, what is God doing to him or for him? What was actually happening here? God made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so on that the, he would lead them to this promised land. And we all know that Moses was not to inherit the land. Reason being, Moses sinned. And I would like for us to read a little bit, just to get a background of what happened. Uh, Numbers, I think, is 20. Numbers chapter 20, and I will look at verse 12. It says here, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give to them. So the children of Israel at one point while in the wilderness, they ran out of water. And they started to murmur and complain. And so Moses went to the Lord and the Lord said to Moses, Look, you go and speak to this rock. And then the rock will give water. But Moses, contrary to what the Lord said to him, when the people murmured in anger, he struck the rock. And he said some things, must we bring water out of this rock? What actually happened there is that Moses robbed God of the glory that God was supposed to get. In a sense, Moses sort of took the credit for bringing the water. The crux of the matter, though, is that Moses sinned. And as a result of this sin, of this sin, God said to him, look what? You are not going to enter the promised land. But God showed him the surface it would look as if God was teasing him but I think what God was actually doing was that God was showing him look I am faithful to my promise I promise this land to your forefathers and I'm going to give it to them he showed them that the promise is going to be fulfilled he showed them what is going to showed Moses what is going to be like in the promised land but Moses was not to go and inherit the land because of his sin this was God executing judgment on Moses. Moses was being sentenced, as it were, for his sin. And we would note that Moses did not die of old age. The Bible tells us a little further down that Moses was still strong, but he died because God said he would die as a result of his sin. I will leave it there for now. 
All right, Elder verse 5, which Elder David would have stopped at. He said that the word of God says that Moses, uh, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. We're going to proceed in the text. I wanted to read verses 6 to 12, and then we're going to come back with some questions for you. So read verse 6 to 12 of Deuteronomy chapter 34. Let's get the full story as to what happened to Moses there uh, before they cross over to the promised land. 34. Beginning from verse 6, and mm -hmm. he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Baal Perot. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses and was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and all the wonders which the Lord sent to him to said to him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. All right. So there we get the full picture as to what took place in Moses. Now, Elder David mentioned about him showing Moses the land, and that would have been a supernatural way of seeing because physically Moses would not be able to see all those lands. The, the children of Israel were not even split up into tribes as yet and we see God giving him a preview, a prelude as to how the children of Israel is going to mature and how they're going to develop and how things are going to take place and so on and so forth. So God gave him a view but God did not allow him to go into the promised land. Uh, then we just read this garden that God said in verse 10, but since then there were, has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. What is God saying here about Moses? I mean, on one hand, Elder God, we have, you can't go into the promised land because you sin. And on the next hand, we have, it seems to me that God is saying that there's not a prophet like Moses ever. He saw God's face. He knew God face to face. So then if I see God face to face, I should be special. Shouldn't I go into the promised land? Isn't that so, um, Sister Gordon? God has oh. done condone sin and so because Moses committed that sin where he stripped God of that glory in the very presence of the children of Israel God had to could not pardon Moses' sin however although he was forgiven he already said also that he should not enter the promised land and although he did not enter the promised land God still was showing Moses that he loved him. So to me, this is an act of love. Moses is whom he looked at face to face. And if we can look at the setting once again, I just need to, uh, while I continue answering the question, look at what, what the elder David just said. What Moses here was about to die, 120 years old. Let us see the blessing. Though he sinned, let us look at the blessing. This is an old man, 120 years old. He climbed, I did a little Google with the Mount Nebo, and the Google says it was about 6,200 and 2,600 something feet high. And Moses at that age had strength enough to climb that mountain. At the top, on the zenith of the mountain, God showed him he could not enter, but God showed him. Moses had 2020 visual elder born. He had 2020 20 vision at 120 years. The man was still blessed. And so Moses too felt the love of God, felt the presence of God. I need to also reflect on something. When Moses was being trained in the desert, it was the burning bush experience. God appeared to him in the burning bush. So it was he and God alone. When God gave him his mandate that he is to deliver the children of Israel. Here upon the threshold of his death, 
It was God and Moses alone, face to face. God loved Moses in spite of what Moses has done. And I have to insert here, the same thing happens to us. God loves us. And once we would have repented and asked God to forgive us, God too will hug us and love us the same way he did to Moses. So as we continue to continue to answer the question, we see here that Moses, the Bible said he died. The Bible never said that Moses had an ailment. They, we don't get the picture that he was a sickly person. He could not have climbed that mountain. His vision was good. He looked at God face to face. He saw the 12 tribes of Israel, the land, just a picture of the land being distributed. So at his death, Moses could have seen that God is faithful to his promise, that God is a promise keeper. And so Moses would have died with that blessed assurance that God is faithful. And even in his death, that one day he would have seen God face to face again. Excellent, excellent, Elder Gordon. Thank you so much for that. We see here Moses, rightfully, as you said, he was full of vigor. The Bible clearly says his natural forces did not abate. He was a strong man. He was vital. He was vigorous. But yet still he died. So then, therefore, since we're looking to the, at the death of Moses, this was, how should I put it? This was a special death. <laughs> I have to put it in my understanding because he wasn't sick, as you quite rightly said. He wasn't sickly. He didn't have a heart attack. He didn't have high blood pressure or cholesterol or whatever. And he climbed a mountain over 2,000 feet high. So this death of Moses is very intriguing because I want to come back now to the memory text that we have for the week that is speaking in Jude. Moses would have died. The Bible says that, and he buried him. I'm reading Jude 24, verse 6. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. He who buried who? And the David help us out here. Who, who buried who? I don't get it. As you said, this is indeed a special death and a special burial also. Before I go into that, I would like to say that God is a really loving and merciful God. Eh? Now Moses was, we can't see a greater tribute than was given to Moses in the last three verses of chapter 34. You and Sister Gordon alluded to it. Said there was not ever a prophet like him before, but yet... Notwithstanding all attribute, he died. He had to die. I think what that says is that God is serious about sin and the penalty for sin. Sin has consequences. So Moses had to pay for his sin, but yet God in his love and his mercy had buried Moses himself. And I think um, there were some reasons for that. Because of what we will discover in tomorrow's lesson, that God was going to resurrect Moses. Not that God put him there because he wanted to know where he was buried but another reason for God burying him and, and God and only God knew where he was is that Moses was such a revered uh, prophet that they would have built shrines and Moses could have turned into idolatry they, they could have been led into idolatry as a re result of shrines built to Moses and so on so as a result of that that was kept from them but God and God alone knew where Moses was buried. God buried Moses. As I studied this, I thought how special Moses really was to God. What a relationship that was. God did not allow anybody to bury him, but buried him himself. God is a loving and merciful God. So Moses said, God still had this special treatment for him. Amen. Excellent. Thank you, Elder David. Yes, Elder Gordon, you have a point to make here? Yes, just to add to that as well, the seriousness of sin and the fact that God has to deal with sin. Could it be that it was also a lesson to the children of Israel? I mean, we have seen in the book of Deuteronomy how repetitively they would fall into sin. Now, when they would have looked at Moses, remember they looked at Moses as a symbol of God, of Christ himself. And when they would have understood that God meant what he said when it comes to sin, that Moses was not able to carry them into the promised land because of the sin he committed. Could those moments, could they have been teachable moments that God was also instructing them that if I did not pardon or I am this strict with Moses, 
You too, when you enter the land of Cana, you must understand that I love you, but I'm going to deal with sin. And I think that should resonate with all of us today as well. God's word cannot change. If he pardoned those prophets in the past, he would have to pardon us. But since he did not pardon them, we too must recognize that though God is loving, though God is kind, he's merciful, he's compassionate, he also must and will destroy sin. And if sin is in us at his judgment time, then we too will be lost. Excellent. Okay. Can I make one more submission here? Right I, see a lot of I see a lot of symbolisms here. I think Moses' death here, and the fact that he was resurrected afterward, symbolized the fact that, look, because of sin, because Adam and Eve sinned, we are going to die here. But when once we would have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and live a life of obedience to him, just like Moses lived again, even though he sinned and had to die, we may die here now. But there is life after death. That's another symbolism I see in it. Yes, indeed, there is life after death. But I want us to come back to this passage here with verse 10 of Deuteronomy 24, where God says, because now he's speaking of Moses and how good he was. He says, but since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And it says even before that, in verse 8, and the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel had heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. The question I want to ask you, Sister Gordon, is that you are just now being, you're being fired from your job. And they're asking you to train the new guy that's coming in to show him all the ropes and all the ins and outs of the business and so on and so forth. Before you before you leave this this office, we've terminated you, but we want you to train this person. <laughs> and let me ask you what you would do, Sister God. <laughs> but what would be the normal response of human beings in terms of something like that? You're fired and you're asked to train somebody and show them all the ins and outs. And not only just I'm fired, but they give me a period of time in order to execute the right do's and don'ts to that person. I think, let's be fair, it takes the mercy and grace of God. I guess hence the reason why the Bible says there isn't another prophet like unto Moses whom God looked at face to face. It's, it will take the mercy of God to understand, especially if I understand why I'm being fired. I, I hope it's a, a just cause. And so regardless of what it was, it takes the mercy and grace of God for me to do so. So yes, once, I, once I'm connected with God, of course, I would happily do so. And to continue, I just like want to reflect on Moses because that is something that, is, that points out and stands out to Moses' legacy. Moses in Deuteronomy 32 and 33 and so on, Moses was there writing poems. Moses was writing songs, not just writing songs, but having the children of Israel singing and reciting about the glory of God, though he knew that he wasn't going to enter the promised land. I think Moses, as we always say, is the meekest and most humble prophet there was, and I guess will ever be. Wonderful, because, you know, that's just a certain level of the reason why I ask the question is because I wanted that exactly to come out as you hit the nail on the head, that Moses was meek and humble. And that doesn't just come from our own strength. That comes from being connected to a higher power than that. And so here he is now showing Joshua, uh, laying his hands upon him, so to speak, and he's parting on to Joshua all that the Lord has shown him. And that is being meek and humble and that's being a loving leader. Now, we have said this several times and we just look at the text that the word of God says there has not been in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. I don't know if the distinction there is the face to face situation, but I just want to tickle your fancy this morning. We may not get into this because time is fastly going. Time is almost up as a matter of fact. But in Luke chapter 7, verse 26, this is what the word of God says. And if you know the text, you know where I'm going. It says, For I say unto you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet 
than John the Baptist. So there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, it says in Luke. This is Jesus speaking. But we know that Moses saw God face to face in the matter of speaking. Elder David, as we close out today, and time is fast spent, as we close out today, we see here Moses dying. We see him being lamented or being mourned for. We see God saying, hey, look, this is the greatest prophet. What does that say about God? Because at the end of the day, all that we studied this quarter, all that we looked at, God must be in the picture. And we must have a picture of God when we have studied all these three months. So Elder David, tell us, what does that say about God? You mean the fact that he made the pronouncement about Moses being the best prophet? Mm -hmm. I think that just speaks to the fact that Moses indeed cultivated a good, close relationship with God. I think God would have said that because it's the closest relationship I think he might have cultivated at that time with any human being. God loved Moses. He cared for him. Moses, even though Moses um, is a human being, he had his faults and so on, but Moses loved the Lord also, and that love extended to the people of God. So God and Moses had a special relationship, and God must have seen that in Moses, why he would have made that pronouncement. Excellent. And as you close out today, the day, just give us your takeaway and perhaps your impressions for this quarter in terms of the entire study for the quarter. Anything of note you want to mention or impressions upon the quarter's lesson for our viewing and listening audience? This quarter, we looked at Deuteronomy and we just looked at the fact that Moses was, as said by God, the greatest prophet and they would, there has never been a greater prophet. Now, Deuteronomy was written by Moses and it was Moses' last sermons, three sermons to the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. And Moses instructed them as to what was expected of them as they moved into the promised land. What Moses said to the children of Israel has implications for us also. All right, they were moving into the earthly promised land. Today, we have aspirations to enter the heavenly Canaan. And just as Moses instructed them as to how they, they should live, those instructions hold true for us also. We ought to, like Moses did, as he instructed the children of Israel to do, to cultivate a strong, close relationship with God so that as we live our lives, our lives can indeed reflect the character of God. So that first of all, our soul salvation can be preserved. And then as those around us look on, as we dwell among others, there too, would be able to see the character of God developed in us, the love of God shining through us and through our lives, through the God that they would see in us, they too would be drawn to him and be prepared to go over into that promised land also. Excellent. Thank you, Elder David. Elder Gordon, I come to you now, your final words for today, impressions upon the quarter and indeed for the lesson for today. What's your takeaway? Yes, uh, my takeaway is in studying the book of Deuteronomy, I'm reminded of the love of God. And his love, his, he dispensed to us by giving us his Ten Commandments, which is still binding on all of us today. And last week, Tuesday's lesson, Curse on a Tree. Oh, we have to be so thankful for the old rugged cross, where though the first Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, in Deuteronomy, the promise was made in Genesis, the promise was made. In Deuteronomy, the commandments of God still stand. And on Calvary, Jesus died. He died so that the sin that the first Adam committed, the second Adam nailed that curse to the tree. And so once we are in Christ, we will live victorious life until he comes or call. Amen. Amen. I just want to thank both of you so much for being consistent, for being committed to the task of being here every Tuesday morning as much as possible to uh, look at the Word of God. I wish both of you and your family and your household the best for the holiday seasons. And I pray that you will also continue to study the Word of God and to indeed teach and to reach others for Christ. So thank you, Elder Andy David and Jacqueline Gordon, for your commitment to Whispering Hope and indeed for being here with us every single week. But folks, we want to thank you once again for being present, for 
uh, viewing this this study of the Word of God. We pray and hope that throughout the year that something would have uh, touched your heart, something would have encouraged you to delve deep into the Word of God and to live a practical life of Christianity. If perchance you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we offer the opportunity today. Christ is extending his arm towards you to come into a better relationship with him. We pray that God will continue to bless you even for the remainder of this year. And as we come together once again, uh, we will indeed continue to study God's word. So from all of us here at Whispering Open this morning, from Elder David and Elder Gordon, we wish you a very happy holidays and may God continue to bless you. Thank you for your support and continue to seek and to, and to search for God. God is watching. God is listening. God is there for you. Thank you once again. Have a wonderful morning. The Sabbath School Department of the South Leeward Conference is rolling out its Memory Text Challenge come January 2022. This challenge allows each member of our Sabbath School classes across our conference to demonstrate his or her ability to recite Memory Text for the 13 Sabbaths each quarter. Each local church will then select a few names for each Sabbath School division and send the names to the superintendent to get a local church champion. The emerging champions of each level will take part in the next level, that being the district council runoff, the zonal or island council runoff, and finally the grand championship at the conference level. This can be done via Zoom and each champion must be decided based on accuracy, eloquence and a speedy delivery. There are incentives for champions at each level and the grand champion will be handsomely rewarded by the South Leeward Conference. So, what are you waiting for? Take part. Show us what you got with our memory text challenge as we study to show ourselves approved.